Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good day, Diane. How are you? Welcome to the Cash Bar. You're doing good. I'm excited about this episode. Cool. Pour yourself a drink. This is going to be a weird one. They're all weird, but this one's going to be especially fraught with weirdness because we're <laughs> doing something that I know nothing about, absolutely nothing about. And I'm not going to pretend that I do know anything about it because I think that would be wrong. We're going to be it. We're doing Tupac today. This is this is Tupac Shakur. We're doing to live and die in L.A. Live and die. All right. Well, to ease your fears, we're basically bringing in. I don't know if he's an expert, but he's he feels very confident about it. So we're going to go ahead and bring in our guest. This is the very funny, funny, the very funny comedian, Mark Ag. Let's bring him in. Let's hope he's ready. There he is. Hey, y'all. Hey, I can hear you great. Cool. I forgot to ask if this was a video pod. It is. Oh. Well, hey, we only have like 40 subscribers on YouTube right now, so I wouldn't sweat it. (laughs) Okay, well, cool. Uh, Good to see you guys. Uh, Mark, Ben, Ben, Mark, I don't know if you guys have ever met. I don't think we have. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks for coming on and doing the show. And I hope this is going to be strange for me because I'm from... I'm from the Canadian prairies and the Texas suburbs. So not a lot of Crips, not a lot of Bloods, not a lot of hip hop. I've always been kind of a nervous liberal dude. So I've never really known how to relate to hip hop, how I'm supposed to enjoy it, if it's even okay for me to enjoy it. So it's gonna be a little weird for me. (laughs) I'm so excited. (laughs) Yeah, I think artists want you to listen to their music in general. <laughs> I, I just love because Ben is the one who reads the lyrics when we go through this, and I love when he gets like super squirrely. Um, <laughs> so Ben, have you decided how you're going to address the N word? Because uh, I have an gonna, idea. Yeah, I was thinking of like of, of of replacing it, but I couldn't think of like anything to replace it with that that wouldn't be condescending or also racist. Like I had somebody suggested to me that you should just, oh, just you're a restaurant guy, you're a restaurant and bar guy. So just instead of using the N word, just say Canadians the way that uh, <laughs> racist restaurant workers do. I'm just like, yeah, but that's also racist. Yeah, it's a, it's a stand. Like, I think I think you just blank it. Just, just say, just say, yeah. And I don't know whether, there's no good approach. It, like, it's like, like even extremely white TV shows now will not bleep because so, it's like then you're censoring someone else's music so that's bad too, right? Yeah, like, I would just say n word. N word. Yeah, n word's always a good fallback. That's my preferred method. I thought it'd be really funny if you said Nilla, like Nilla wafer. Um, but do, do what you feel comfortable with. See, that's the thing. Any, I don't feel comfortable like a, with any of it. Anything that's not like a racial epithet, if you use it in the context of a racial epithet, which is the danger of replacing yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get into these lyrics, um, I'll just tell you when I was talking to Mark trying to figure out which artist we would do, um, I was telling him, you know, the whole podcast has really been lacking in hip hop. And so we went we went around it through a few topics like uh, Wu Tang. I we almost decided I almost went with Wu Tang because that's kind of like when I was in high school in the 90s, um, I was very diverse musically. Like I could switch from erasure, like I love, love 80s new wave, but I could flip from erasure to some Method Man really quick. I had Method Man's to Cal on my CD player every night when I went to sleep. Um, and the way I used to think of it is like, when I was listening to Erasure in Super Mario Brothers, when he's above land and it's, you know, blue skies and it's like, do, 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 do. But then when he would go down that tube and it was like, bom, 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 bom. like <laughs> that's where I went at night <laughs> with, <laughs> with Method Man. Like everything, the music just got spooky and it was dark, but it was also like, I don't know, his voice was soothing to me and it just, it would put me out. Mm-hmm. He, does, he does have one of the all time classic voices uh, for a rapper. Yeah. Uh, Sound like he'd been smoking his whole life at what in his twenties. Yeah, yeah. The, the the thing was, he was like the he was like the straight edge guy from Wu Tang. He like worked in a shoe store, I think, when they when they started. Uh, all the rest of them were drug dealers. He was like, "Nah, I'm selling sneakers." <laughs> well, he pulled it off like he was um, a scary thug, at least to a teenage white girl like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well, these are, it's a lot of lyrics to this song. So uh, a lot of times we pull lyrics and it's like, you know, four, maybe two or three paragraphs, but we, we might need to get into this quick. <laughs> okay, here we go. 
Do, uh, should I do the, I guess we should do the intro too. All right, sure. Street Science, you're on the air. What do you feel when you hear a record like Tupac's new one? I love Tupac's new record. Right, but don't you feel like that creates tension between East and West? I mean, he's talking about killing people. I had sex with your wife and not in those words, but he's talking about, I want to see you deceased. Rough stuff. Yeah, the, con had... the context from if, uh, you get. Do you guys play the song before we start the? Uh... I don't have. We've looked into it so much, and I just think we would get in trouble. We don't have yeah. any kind of rights, so we YouTube can't. Might, YouTube might strike it. Yeah. So if, if you're not yeah. familiar with the context, like there's like a, it's one of those uh, things that happened in '90s rap where records had a ton of skits on it, and this was like uh, a caller to a radio call-in show where they're discussing Tupac's. Uh, uh, I get the time I hit him up the, the famous diss track he made about. Biggie and uh, um, and uh, the bad boys about uh, killing them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when he says like I had I had sex with your wife, that's the uh, that would obviously is a reference to Biggie's wife, right? Who was Biggie married to at the time? Faith Evans. Uh, yeah, Faith Evans. It's uh, it, like the, the, literally the first the, before even before the music comes in, I hit him up. It just Tupac goes, "That's why I fucked your bitch, you fat motherfucker." And then the, the, <laughs> that's the first thing he says in this song. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna establish he's a little bit of a shit talker. <laughs> yeah. Before we get into this. Not a shy man. No. To live and die in LA, California. What you say about Los Angeles? Still the only place for me. It never rains in Southern California. So this is gonna be the California banger, the rah rah LA. I have both lived and died in LA. <laughs> <laughs> I went out there, got my ass kicked, came back home. <laughs> How about you, Mark? Uh, well, I'll probably die here. Uh, okay. I've lived here for about a decade. Uh, uh, poor Tupac, he had, uh, he lived in LA for a long time, but he died in Vegas, so his prediction didn't even come true. Yeah, close, mm. close. Yeah. <laughs> to live, oh, here we go, all right. To live and die in LA, where every day we try to fatten our pockets. Us, mm, hustle for the cash, so it's hard to knock it. Everybody got their own thing, currency chasing. Worldwide through the hard times, worrying faces, shed tears as we bury close to the heart. So he's acknowledging it. Like it's, it's, I, I mean, I've always heard about, about hip hop stars like, like, like Tupac, that their, that their lyrics can be very introspective and, and very thoughtful if you've got the experience to, to, to listen to it, if you, if you, if you come from a world where, where you can understand them. To me, I don't, like, I just don't. I always tell the story, like I, I worked with a guy who was a, uh, who was a drug dealer and he'd spent some time in prison and he, he was working at the, the bar that I worked at and I would drive him home every night. And he would tell me these stories about drug dealing and gang banging and he would end every sentence with, you know how it is. You know how it is. Like, I, no, I don't know how it is. Like, I just don't. I've never done anything like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, well, a little bit about, I mean, about his life and stuff, like he was a like an artsy kid. Like his parents were like poets and political activists. His dad was a Black Panther. Um, his mom did have a drug problem, and I think she spent some time in jail. But um, he went to like a performing arts high school and was an actor and stuff. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't like what, whatever people think of as like a, like a like a like a thuggish kid or whatever. That wasn't really Tupac. He had like a like a turn towards gangster stuff that he didn't really understand in his twenties, and that was after he got. Uh, he became a public enemy number one for police and may or may not have been uh, sent to prison on some flim flammy shit and got sexually assaulted every day by prison guards and came out very angry at the system as one might imagine. Holy and, uh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. They would, they would come up with, uh, they would come up with reasons to give him body, ca body cavity searches every day. Uh, it was another way to put that as they raped Tupac every day. Yeah. 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 He would, so, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure if a lot of people know this, but like Tupac first burst into the, in the public, like he he started off rapping with like Digital Underground, which is like party music. And yep. then he made his own record, which was like some consciousness rap and some just like party music or whatever. This, this, the, how he became famous the first time around was this dude got pulled over uh, in Texas and killed a cop. And his defense lawyer tried to keep him from getting the death penalty. He said if he was because he was listening to Tupac's tape, that's why he did it. So Tupac became a meme before that was the thing and, and it, like the, the, the moral panic over, over rap as a guy who got a cop kill. This is like, when, this is back when cops were calling in death threats over uh, uh, to uh, Ice-T's uh, Ice cop killer record. 
right. and bomb threats to the, to the record company that they dropped. This is like in the middle of all that. So middle that's of the whole like, body count, the government was getting involved. Yeah. So that's so that's um, that's he was hated very very much by law enforcement. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's who mainly who was famous among at first before he got out of prison and made the double record and the, the East Coast West Coast feud and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Which, Sorry, this is when he's a, yeah, this so, is when he's a kid too. Like that's what I found like, the hardest to understand about about his story. Like, like you're, you're talking about him going to he's 20 years old, right? Like we're talking yeah. about a very young man. Yeah. He, I mean, he died. At, like, he gets lumped in with like the 27 Club, but he got killed a couple of months after turning 25. He didn't even make it that like that long. He died very, very like you look at like um like rappers that got to live. Like they're like cuddly kids. Ice Cube makes kids movies. Snoop Dogg's in TV shows of Martha Stewart. Tupac died basically with teenage angst. He never got a chance to like turn into an adult and see what he would have become. Right. So yeah. Who knows? He might have run for Congress as a Republican. You don't never know. You never know whether twenty minutes could help for Tupac. <laughs> yeah, we talked about this before we started. Like, um, the amazing way some of these people can live so much by the time they're twenty three. Like we were even relating it to Eddie Murphy's Raw. I think he did that at twenty three. Like, can you? Uh, fucking imagine where your comedy was when you were 23 like yeah i'm so embarrassed by my thoughts when i was 23 and the jokes i was writing it just blows my mind like we'll get into later how quickly he wrote the song and how quickly the whole thing got produced it was literally a matter of, a, a matter of two hours um yeah and that that shit just makes me mad sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah when genius you're, when you're just like Fuck, shit, why are we yeah. all working so hard i can't do this how yeah. dare you be so talented how <laughs> dare you <laughs> yeah it's, it's, just, it's just very easy for some people i mean like when the, 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 he still had records coming out like years after he died because they had such a catalog of music which is always fucked up because did he, he maybe he didn't want that out there maybe he thought it sucked maybe it was in the back of his version of his joke notebook you know so working on yeah. it yeah mm -hmm. yeah all right, where'd we leave off? We left off at shed tears as we bury close to the heart. Who was a friend is now a ghost in the dark. I like that line. Mm -hmm. That's a good line. The, the passing of a friend. That's uh, it, it's kind of strange to me because it, it's I'm I'm 41 now, and when I was younger, like like in your early 20s, you usually lose a couple of friends to to car crashes or or you know accidents and things like that but then it's like the seasons of our lives work where you don't start dying again until you're in your 40s <laughs> and that's sort of where i am now <laughs> you know where like the, my friends who have been drinking and doing drugs like their their bone machine is just wearing out so it's like the it's the yeah kind of like the, the, the second round of that is sort of happening in, in my larger world these days but yeah i really like that line about how you know who was a friend is now a ghost in the dark because that could really be how it feels yeah. They're just yeah. gone. It's a ghost that has slipped away. Sorry, I didn't mean to get dark. But this is going to be a dark song. <laughs> Cold hearted about it. N word got smoked by a fiend trying to floss on him. Okay, this is the first one that we're coming to. There will be more. Don't know what that means. <laughs> what? <laughs> trying uh, to floss on him. What's that about? Uh, conspicuous consumption. Trying to look cool. Wearing something fancy around him. Ah, uh, okay. Trying yeah. to show so, off. Okay. Yeah, yeah, showboating. Yeah. He, wore, he, he, wore, he, wore, he wore diamond watch around a poor crackhead and got killed for it. Uh, Something like that. But it okay. This is a oh, way okay. more poetic way to explain that. I got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so trying to floss on him blind to a broken man's dream. So yeah, like you say, flashing a lot of flashing a lot of cash around somebody who doesn't have any. Gotcha. Yeah. A hard now, lesson. I, there's something about like um that's something that occurred to me when I first moved to LA. It's like like there's a <laughs> this song is very um it's upbeat about a place he loves, but also has a melancholy undertone to it. And he's like, it's a very, it's a very LA thing because like there's so much conspicuous, there's so many, so much money here, mm -hmm. and it's mixed in with everybody. Like you'll you'll be at Pink's Hot Dogs with a bunch of other broke drunk people at 11 p.m. on a Saturday night, and a 16 year old will pull up in a Lamborghini and get, not get out and get in the same line as you. Like yeah. there's like there's like a reason there's always there's huge riots once a decade in LA. Yeah. yeah. It's like always in your face. Yeah. I was at the uh, at the Griffith Park Observatory a couple of years ago and I saw like I, I swear it was a scene out of a movie. Like it was we were trying to 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 go back down and there was a kid in a in a fancy red convertible who just comes like rocking like it's 5 miles per hour in the parking lot but he's doing 35 just peeling through and he gets pulled over by the mountain cops 
who are yelling, and, and he's, he literally is looking at the cops just with all the entitlement in the world, and he literally says, do you know who my father is? And I just like, I couldn't believe, like, this is really happening? Like, I <laughs> thought this was just a TV show. Who says that? Oh my God. Yeah. But then the cop said my favorite line ever, your dad ain't shit on my fucking mountain. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he's heard that before. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, two days later, the cop was probably fired. <laughs> <laughs> Guess he was shit on my mountain. All right. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Oregon. A hard lesson. Court cases keep me guessing. Plea bargain ain't an option now, so I'm stressing. Cost me more to be a free man than a life in the pen. Making money off of cuss words, writing again, learning how to think ahead, so I fight with my pen. I like that. Like, like you're saying, like you don't know he may run for office as a, as a Republican, but he clearly, you know, he had it in his head that his real talent was communicating and, and, and mm -hmm. using words more than his fists or his, or his bullets. Like, yeah. he, like you say, like reading that lyric, like at 25, you know, what would that guy be thinking at 35? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I hope he would have figured it out and been happy because I don't think he was happy. <laughs> When I yeah. read this line, it made me have to go look at like the timeline of all the times he was arrested and all the different things. And um, at this point, when he wrote this song, the last plea bargain he accepted was kind of way back when after uh, being accused of trying to hit another rapper with a baseball bat uh, following the Michigan State University concert. Um, he ended up taking a plea bargain for that. But um, before all of this, I mean, he had already by the time he wrote the song, he had already spent time in prison for the sexual assault charge and others, um, like uh, have, having possession of a gun uh, while on bail. And he had gone back for like 150 days or so. Um, so he's a he's far away from plea bargains at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, for people that don't know about his, like his sexual assault trial, when he was... <sighs> He had had he had had consensual sex with this woman that they both agree was consensual, and then she came back to his hotel room the next day, and she claims that he lured her there to be raped by these other guys, um, uh, which is awful that that happened to her. Um, but it wasn't clear. Tupac thought it was unfair that he was convicted for other guys' crimes and felt like he was malicious prosecution over the, the Houston cop thing. I don't know, we, yeah. I, I wasn't there, you know. That's but. where it gets sticky. I mean, you know, people are obviously not <laughs> one dimensional. You can be a lyrical genius and charismatic and loving and still do fucked up shit. Like we saw what happened to Cosby and other people. So we're not gonna deny that this is possibly true, especially knowing later, it kind of happened again with Faith Evans, but she said no, mm -hmm. um, like he, she sang on, she sang a lyric on one of his songs and then she was trying to get paid for him, paid by him. And he had her come to the hotel room and kind of the same scene played out again where he's like, I'll give you this check, but you gotta like perform sex. And she was like, fuck it. And she just didn't get paid for it. So seeing that he has a track record of doing this twice, maybe isn't looking great for him. No, um, yeah. Uh, I, I would just say that like, I didn't, when I was a teenager liking his music, I didn't know this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, I can work. I can say every line of Cosby's himself. Okay, none of us know what people are capable of. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that in mind, we'll just keep it in mind and just put it over there to get through these lyrics for now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's easier to, for me to separate art from artists with stuff like music because the song, the song speaks for itself. Where it comes to comedy, like you're really deciding whether you're not like like the person and their point of view, and certainly whether or not they're a a monster behind the scenes impacts that more than whether or not a song is a good beat or whatever. You know? Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's hard. Like whenever I laugh at the chocolate cake joke, I laugh with just a little more information. <laughs> it's, it doesn't hit quite as hard, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, where are we? Uh, late night down sunset, like in the scene, what's the worst they could do to an N word? Got me lost in hell for living and die in LA on bail. When I lived in LA, I used to love the Sunset Strip. I think we all did. Like I was 24 or 25 when I lived out there and I would, I would just walk up and down it all night long and I couldn't believe that I was here. You know, this is, <laughs> this is what Tupac raps about. This is where, you know, this is where Guns N' Roses are from, man. Lemmy's probably around here somewhere. Like it really yeah. has like kind of like that entire, and of course the comedy store, like all you have to do is walk by that and go, holy crap, that's Richard Pryor's hometown. That's Robin Williams. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's like a, uh, it's like when you live in LA and New York because all, like so much culture is made there, you get this vague sense that you live in the center of the world, which of course it makes people really arrogant. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, like I was, I was watching um, some Netflix show. I was like, oh, I've been to that bar. I've been to that. He's like, you know, it's oh, this is, I live in the TV, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You re- and it's the same w- thing with people who live in New York. A lot of, we have friends who now live in New York and LA and the way they talk about taking the train like you know and i'm like not everybody not every city has a fucking train <laughs> you know mm-hmm. you, this isn't yeah. how the most of the world works when i started doing stand-up in texas there'd be um you know the headliners would come through and they'd bring a feature and it'd be like a new york feature and they'd be doing like 25 minutes on subways and uh, uh what, what what it's like dating puerto ricans <laughs> and i'm like this is dallas man nobody knows about either of this <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't think I met my first Jewish person till college. <laughs> I, I swear to God, I, I grew up in a very small town in the South. I didn't meet my first Jewish person or Catholic person till college. Uh, I my first Ash Wednesday in college. Um, I didn't know what Ash Wednesday was because I grew up Baptist. We didn't celebrate that. So I'm just walking down campus walk, and I see all these people with black X's on their forehead. The, <laughs> the, the priest is in a hurry does the X. And I'm like, what fucking bizarre cult? <laughs> You're like, it's Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> when I was a when I was a teenager, my girlfriend was Catholic, and she came over to my house on Ash Wednesday with with the with the mark on her head, and I opened You're the door, like, and I just immediately went, "Oh, you got like I literally was like, it's Ash Wednesday, you idiot!" Oh, <laughs> got some smuts. <laughs> Actually, some smuts. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. You got some smuts on your head. <laughs> All right, the, the lyric sheet that I'm reading, I, and, and again, I had to I had to look this up because I'm dumb and I'm way out of my depth here. But uh, the lyric sheet says that it was uh, it's Machiavelli. And at, at first, like, when I was first reading through the lyrics, I was just like, oh, this must be like kind of like a, a duet, or this guy Machiavelli <laughs> is uh, is doing a couple of verses on this song. It's That's Chris not Gaines. true, is it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's a uh, one of one of his nicknames he gave himself. Tupac's his actual name, not. You know, he started spelling it with a two, of course, which is not his name, but then Machiavelli was like a, a, a nickname he gave himself, like Method Man, you know, to Cal, what was some of Method Man's other, he had some other nicknames, I can't, I'm blanking right now for what he called himself, but yeah. yeah this is the trio of names. My angel sing, to live and die in LA, it's the place to be and the angels go. You've got to be there to know it when everybody else want to see to live and die in LA. To live and die in LA, it's the place to be. You've got to be there to know it when everybody want to see. Got it. It's true. <laughs> everybody does want to live in LA. I forget which comic it was that I, that I saw a, a couple of years ago. It kind of came through and said, I live in Los Angeles like you wish you did. <laughs> like the big joke was just very like, and I think it's true. Like New Yorkers <laughs> say that all the time. Like I think everybody who doesn't live in New York is just kidding themselves. Like, oh, come on. It's LA. Like every like like you you want to live in Calabasas or Beverly Hills or, yeah. or Venice. I mean, I could have, like if you're especially if you have money. I mean, like the, the weather. Mm-hmm. I mean, like right now it's a uh, sixty seven degrees in February third. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, trees are green. You know. Yeah, it's a different sixty seven degrees. Like in Houston, it's nice in the sixties, but the trees are bare. It still looks like winter. It feels more like winter, even in Texas. Um, but LA, I mean, every time I'm there, I'm like, you, for fuck's sake, are you serious? They just get to live in this weather all the time. Mm-hmm. First time I came out here was your apartment hut. And I was, I was in like 2011 and it was like summer in, in Dallas. So it was like 115 degrees. And then you yeah. get here and you still need a jacket at night because it fits down to the 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 fifties and sixties and it's like oh shit I didn't know I think I, I don't know what I thought but in my head I thought L A was hot <laughs> <laughs> right it's close to the desert right yeah yeah no it's wonderful it's it's upsetting and like I spent more time like in upstate New York and I'm like it just smells good what the fuck is that eucalyptus trees I don't know it just smells better <laughs> yeah it's they're all uh, people from the city to get their little zip cars and drive up there and go leaf peeping or whatever it is. <laughs> Call it, they call it leaf peeping, right? When you look at leaves. I could I could do that. <laughs> Go apple picking, get some cider. Come on. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. All right, we got another whole page of fucking lyrics, so let's keep going. All right. It wouldn't be LA without Mexicans. Black love, brown pride, and the sets again. Well, Pete hold Wilson on. Trying. You oh. skipped like a chunk, I think. Oh, did Wait. I? Yeah, I think you skipped the second verse. Yeah. Do you want me oh, to shit, read it if you no, don't have no, it? No, I'm sorry. 
No, I've got it. I've got it. Okay. Sorry, I just, I just, I just scrolled down accidentally. I apologize. It's the city of angels in constant danger. South Central LA can't get no stranger. Full of drama like a soap opera on the curb. Watching the ghetto bird helicopters, I observe so many N words getting three strikes, tossed in jail. So that's obviously a reference to the uh, the three strike California law that saw so very many people locked up. Yeah, you uh, get you get third felony, you get life in prison. So that life. So, yeah, so like if you're if the uh, and the, fe- the prosecutor can stretch the laws to make things felonies. Like if like a, a, a shoplifting turns into a robbery, if uh, you bumped into somebody running out because that's yeah. that's mm-hmm. violent. So um, like yeah, you could you shoplift a candy bar and didn't get life in prison for it. I mean, not that I'm encouraging shop. Actually, I'm fucking shoplift. Yeah, shop. Get, yeah, get a candy bar. <laughs> yeah, it's it was it was a very. Um, a uh, convenient way to to stretch the system and like to just throw more people in jail. And this law was signed by California Governor Pete Wilson, whose name will come up later in the lyrics. Yeah. Oh. Uh, do, 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 full of drama's good part. I swear the pen right across from hell. I can't cry because it's on now. I'm just an N-word on his own now. Living the thug lifestyle, so I can't smile. Living living life thug style, so I can't smile. That's always something that, I've, that I, I kind of wondered, about, like, like, where's the sense of humor? Like, I, and again, like, obviously I'm not, I'm not into hip hop. I don't really understand gangster rap, but I think part of the reason why I was resistant to it is because there doesn't seem to be that, that openness. You know, like if, if it's, it feels like a closed off world to me because I'm not part of it, right? <laughs> there, there's, and there's, there's doesn't seem to be an entry point because of exactly this, where he's saying, I, I'm living, he, 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 literally he's living the thug lifestyle in the street, so he can't smile. Because what good would be a you know a grinning? That's just not scary. But at the same time, you look at this video and it's just fucking happy. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. There is that. I mean, um, you can call it toxic masculinity or whatever you want, but rappers often won't be smiling in pictures. Like there's this famous gifs of or gifs, have you say it of, uh, of Kanye will be smiling at a basketball game, realizes on a camera, and go back to a frown. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's more of a branding thing, but also it's just like when your first representations in pop, pop culture as a people or as like, you know, those minstrel, show, minstrel shows and shit where somebody grinning like like a dummy and it's like, it's like that's how, I mean, you just don't want to be thought of as like not taken seriously. So that's, that, that, that turns into part of it, I think. Right, I yeah. see that. You want to look cool. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me, my, my kid brother was a, uh, was a like a semi-professional hockey player for a while and he's got all of these great team photos because what they would do is they would they would single one guy out and they would just like they would all be in on the joke except for one guy and they would just they'd say okay everybody big smiles hey eh? big smiles we're gonna send this one home to mom and then there'd be like this team photo of everybody with their hard ass mean looking <laughs> hockey broken noses and one guy with a great big hey! <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic great yeah. <laughs> i live for shit like that that's great <laughs> real, real men don't smile ben <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, how did you fall for that <laughs> we, we don't get to wear warm clothes we don't get to use umbrellas and we don't get to smile we don't get to die in miserable and in pain and unhappy otherwise people will think we're soft and perhaps even gay <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to smile. You can think I'm soft and gay. All you like. It's fine, world. Go for it. Uh, <laughs> writing to my peoples when they ask for pictures, thinking Cali, just fun and bitches. Better learn about the dress code. B's and C's. B's and C's. Can you oh, do no. it? Buds and Crips. Uh, he's, he's saying oh, you, he, you better know what to wear because you, you, if you wear blue or red in the wrong neighborhood, you get jumped or shot. So he's like, holy mm-hmm. living. Yeah. Yeah, like, when so much one than can- I thought. Am I the only one that can throw up the blood sign real fast? I couldn't, I couldn't do that. In <laughs> I did it so much in high school. I don't, it was just like, I was obsessed with it because I'm like, how the fuck do they bend their fingers like that so fast? I have these tiny little paws. It's so hard to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, when, when I first, my, my roommate, uh, the, uh, I moved here with a uh, community by the name of Tone Bell, um, uh, he uh, happens to be black. He, get, he had a pair of red Converse that he like really cool red leather converse that he gave me when we moved here because he's like I, i'm a black dude i can't walk around la in red shoes or a, 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 a yeah. cripple to me <laughs> he was like he was so afraid of that because i was like, wondering is it still going to the strength that it was in the 90s no i mean that the crack the crack epidemic made all made all that worse and that's that, that that's sort of part of the tragedy of this, the, this 
tail of like people call it East Coast, West Coast rap war, but it was very one sided because the crack epidemic is so much worse in the West Coast than it was East Coast. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Biggie and Tupac were both killed by West Coast drug gangs. It, used to be, it was a it, it was like the American Iraq war. It was just right. America attacking Iraq. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so I, but no, we, but it still is like, we, we did a um, scouting for this TV show I was working on. There's a guy uh, named Hodari who's cool as shit, but it, he's like a, he's like an OG uh, 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 crip or he, who was before he, before he got out of prison. He decided to make his straight living. Um, he gave tours. It was called like, you go down to Hollywood, you do talk about going on a hot, like Sunset Boulevard, you go to Hollywood Boulevard, you know, those like celebrity home tours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He had, he had a little one near there. It's called hood life tours. And he would drive you around to like famous locations in hip hop. Like you'll you go to where Biggie was shot and you'll go to like wow. where original Danny was, uh, was beaten with the brick and where, uh, uh, and where, uh, um, like, Kendrick Lamar's first album was a picture of his house. You can go to his house. He went to like where easy E's son lives and like, the the drove by the high school where both Kendrick and Dr. Dre went, and um, it's that's wow. down that's down on Pyru 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 Avenue, I think. Um, it's the Pyru Bloods are famous, right? Bang, and like people were still wearing red in the neighborhood, and this was in 2019. So it's like okay, it's, yeah, interesting. All right, good to know. Hodari is the rapper of the game. He's the game stepdad. He's a cool guy. Take us tour if you ever come here. Come here. <laughs> Would love to. That sounds like way more fun tour than what like all my friends, they would be jumping on a different bus, but <laughs> that, I would like to see that. <laughs> yeah, because he knows like he was he was in a drug gang and I mean, he knows like the, the actual the history of like what happened. Like I, I, it turns out an open secret. He told us who killed Tupac and the documentaries all say the same thing. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know the case was open and shut. It was just the cops couldn't prove it because they're too, they're too corrupt. Is it? People it seems a, so obvious when you like I listened to that slow burn podcast yeah. and you know they don't tell you who did it but you can kind of draw your own conclusion after you listen to it you're like this is I like to use Occam's razor <laughs> in my life the simplest uh is usually the worst I mean the worst the simplest is usually the uh I can't say words today you know what I'm saying um yeah, yeah. the simplest, the simplest explanation is yeah. usually that what it is and I was just like yeah, this seems open and shut to me. It seems real obvious who killed him. Yeah, people. You know, Orlando Baby Lane Anderson was the number one suspect. He died. We can say that because you can't you can't uh, libel the dead. And he got shot to death about a year after uh, Tupac was killed. Um, and uh, uh, he, he basically, the beef started. Uh, Orlando's crew. Well, they were uh, back up a little bit. Death Row was blood affiliated. Uh, nobody really cared about uh blood bloods versus crip stuff when it came to making money because because like like snoop dog was on death row and snoop dog snoop dog was crip affiliated right right so those dog pound um they, they, it was as long as they were all making money nobody cared but so but they were all in the same office building so one day uh somebody from orlando set jumped some of uh, somebody's friends with tupac and stole his chain right they're in vegas uh tupac sees the guy or uh this this crew jumped his buddy and goes over and starts a fight uh, try to, to, to give revenge for still in the chain later that night they see Tupac on the street and shoot at him that, that's 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 a pretty clear-cut case but the problem is a bunch of bloods worked for Suge Knight about a bunch of cops worked security for Suge Knight um uh a, a, a bunch of police were blood and crip affiliated and I, I don't mean they were just taking pay payoffs to be in, uh, to look at the way for drugs I mean they were in the gang and then joined the police department <laughs> uh, right so, they just, they just didn't have any credibility to build any sort of case in this world. And that's what they do. Just like LAPD was too corrupted at the time. And they couldn't, uh, they couldn't point fingers at anybody involved without pointing fingers at each other because it was probably police officers in and around Vegas for that fight night. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, if you listen to those podcasts and watch those documentaries, I think most people just sit back and be like, yeah, we got it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we know who did it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's always it's always kind of amazed me that that's not a name that's 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 out there in, in the in the public eye. Like I think if you ask, you know, your random person on the street, like who killed Tupac, nobody's going to know. But yeah, as yeah. soon as you watch any documentary, like it's it's crystal clear what's uh, what's happened. But it's amazing because yeah. you think you'd think it would be everywhere. It's a who killed Biggie is a much bigger mystery that yes. has much, yeah. much, much more in depth conspiracy theories. Um, yeah, that's a lot more layered because you know that's 
yeah, yeah. We can get into that later, but that that yeah. seems to be where Suge seems to maybe be a little more involved. Yeah, I mean, it's like these things, like people don't talk to cops, right? They're not, they're not gonna tell us, but like 500 people saw Biggie get murdered. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it doesn't, like, it's not like, people know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, like let's, it is out. let's fly through where? the rest of this. All right, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, all them other N words, copycats. These is G's. I love Cali like I love women because every N in LA got a little bit of thug in him. We might fight amongst each other, like you're saying, but I promise you this: we'll burn this bitch down. Get us pissed to live and die in LA. Yeah, we all know what that's referring to. Yeah, the uh, uh, riots were just a couple years. Uh, the Rodney King riots were just a couple years uh, prior to this. Yeah, so. a couple years prior. Yeah. And then it's into the chorus again. Uh, my angel saying to live and die in L.A. It's the place to be. And the angels go. You got to be there to know it when everybody want to see to live and die in L.A. To live and die in L.A. It's the place to be. You got to be there to know it when everybody want to see dramatic reading. All right. And here we go into the verse. I'm sorry. I skipped ahead to this. It wouldn't be L.A. without Mexicans. Black love, brown pride and the sun sets and the sets again. Pete Wilson trying to see us all broke. I'm on some bullshit out for everything they owe. Remember K-Day? K-Day. Uh, K-Day is a radio station here that um, was, it was like the, the one the, the America's flagship hip-hop station, uh, well, the West Coast okay. flagship hip-hop station. And then it got rebooted. Now it's still on the air now, but now it plays old school. It just played, play, basically it re re rebooted and plays the same songs it played back when Tupac. Back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Weekends, Crenshaw, MLK, Automatics rang free, N-words lost their way, gang signs being shown, N-word, love your hood, but recognize and it's all good. Where the weed at? N-word's getting shermed out. Is that shrooms? Shermed out. <laughs> I don't know. I think it just means really high. Okay. I'm not, yep. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that slang term, but from context, I'm assuming, it, because the, the, the prior lines about weed yeah. and the, yeah. following, so the following lines about Snoop Dogg. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to assume from context, the whole, all three lines are about weed. <laughs> I'm just gonna steal it for all my friends who are super into shrooms now. I'm gonna say they're getting shermed out. Yep. It sounds more like it. So the onomatopoeically, it sounds more like a shroom thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Onomatopoeia. <laughs> I love that word. What's well, a perfect word for what it is? I, it's also like it. It's a word about how things, words sound like what they sound, what, what they're describing, but it sounds nothing like any other word. <laughs> it's, somebody was just fucking with us. Like, how do yeah. we put a word to the, and then you're like, let's go crazy with this one. <laughs> yeah, it's like the simplest idea in the world. Like when a dog barks, we call it bark because it sounds like bark. And then- <laughs> How do we describe this? A word with 37 vowels in it. <laughs> 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 Snoop Dogg in this motherfucker permed out. MOB Big Shug in the low low bounce and turn. Let's talk Maybe about MOB was... real quick. Now, yeah. he money would like bitches. to say out loud it's money over bitches. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. But, you know, Suge had it everywhere, which everybody knows it's also a member of Bloods and Suge's club 662 on the keypad is MOB. Um, so we kind of see the cross, like it's an easy thing to represent and then be like, no, I'm saying money over bitches. Like, it's easy to cover your ass that way. But I feel like everybody kind of knew, like I think Suge uh, got MC Hammer, who was on Death Row Records to get MOB tattooed on his body as well, which is fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. Hammer don't hurt him. <laughs> not think of a, least gang, a less gangster dude than MC Hammer. No, you know, I did know, cheerleading routines to his music. You know, children's cartoon about being a superhero with magic shoes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going. There, there are probably some pictures of 10-year-old me in what I considered hammer pants. I'm not <laughs> going to go looking for them, but they are there. They're there we, somewhere. We all have them. <laughs> Next to my Cavaricis. Dog pound in the Lex with an ounce to burn. I guess Dog Pound, that, that'll, be, that'll be Soup Dog's Entourage, yeah? Yeah, yeah they made their own albums, too. Um, I'm blanking on the I name. I know right a now. thing! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Proud of you. Thank you very much. Got them Watts N-words with me, OFTB. I don't know what that is. Anybody OFTB? No. I don't Call know. It, 
call in listeners we're not live somebody will tell us <laughs> somebody's already laughing that i have no idea what that is that shouldn't be a surprise they got some hash took the stash left the rest for me neck bone tray heron big bunch two. big rock got knocked out but this one's for you i hit the studio and drop a jewel hoping it pay I'm getting high watching time fly to live and die in la so he's having a good time <laughs> I imagine that's just that's a rundown of his uh, of his close friends and associates. His mm -hmm. <laughs> associates. Yeah, he's just it's just, it's, just a, it's just describing a fun day with his friends. You know, yeah. it's very it's very wholesome. He's like seeing my love in L.A. and like he's like just drive around, smoke weed, and see all my books, see all my boys. See my so boys. You're, you're wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> L.A.'s cruise and culture. We're back mm -hmm. into the chorus again to live and die in L.A. The place to be. You've got to be there to know it when everybody want to see. And then the final is that. Uh, this go out for 92.3 and 106. All the radio stations that be bumping my shit, making my shit sells quadruple, quadruple platinum to live and die in LA. Mm -hmm. This go out to all the magazines that support an N-word, all the real motherfuckers to live and die in LA, all the stores, the mom and pop spots, A&R people, and all y'all motherfuckers. LA, California love, part motherfucking two without gay ass Dre. Now, I want to be very clear that it's Tupac saying without gay ass Dre and not Dan Mulgrave. <laughs> I, want, I want nothing to do with Dr. Dre, even if he is in his 60s now. For how old he is. So, yeah. That's still, mm. I, I, be, I believe at this point, Dr. Dre had, had a falling out with Suge Knight over money and left to uh, start um, Ackerman. Yeah. And so this is a business dispute where Tupac was very loyal and just took Suge's side in it. Yeah. Um, mm. Because Suge had. Uh, if you're wondering how he got out of jail so quick for the uh, the sexual assault trial, the uh, Suge paid his uh, paid a bond while he appealed appealed his sentence, and then eventually eventually he got back down to time served, I think. But uh, yeah, Tupac was really appreciative of, of Suge Knight spending millions of dollars to get him out of prison. Yeah, right. Yeah, he just kind of was uh, his his boy, his real hard his boy after that, which I get it. Mm -hmm. jail, I don't think jail was nice to. Uh, to Tupac from what we've heard. Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it's also it's in, like, I know I said some in the beginning, but it's important to remember he didn't grow up like, I mean, he, he he grew up in and around like poor neighborhoods, but like as far as being in gang culture, it, he was sort of wading into a thing he didn't fully understand the depths of and sort of got it, it's kind of what got him killed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have some just fun facts I want to get through. Um, the first one is, did you know that Tupac auditioned for the role of Bubba in Forrest Gump? <laughs> no. I mean, Can you? <laughs> we talked about him dying so young, like all the music he made. He was in a bunch of movies and some good movies. I know. He, he was supposed to be in the Phantom Menace, but um he died. So oh, he didn't get to be in it. Wow. Yeah, so I'm just trying to imagine a world where Bubba is is Tupac. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine a world now where Tupac is uh is Darth Maul. He would be great. <laughs> Darth Maul kind of looks like Tupac a little bit. I, can I know. That. Yeah. <laughs> so I do want to talk about his mom just for a second because I just think um, as a woman who has carried a child that this is fucking insane. So in 71, his mother, uh, Afini Shakur, was accused uh, with 20 other Black Panther members of conspiracy to carry out a bombing in New York. Facing a 300-year sentence, she decided to represent herself in court, which is Whoa. never a good idea. But she interviewed witnesses and put forth legal arguments and she was fucking acquitted. And a month later, she gave birth to Tupac. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> that is in him. Like that fight and that psychosis is in him. That's crazy mm -hmm. to me. That's crazy to me. Dude, I'm, I'm looking at his, uh, his uh, filmography. He hosted SNL twice in 1996. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> That's the same year he died twice. Yeah, yeah. He, he was uh, uh, he he was a guest host. He was a host once, a musical guest. Maybe it's the same episode, but it listed twice. Okay. Yeah. Um. But uh. Yeah. I mean, think of, like he was. He appeared. Like I say, he hosted SNL. He appeared on a different in a different episode of a different world and on In Living Color. The man has a better comedy career than I do. By <laughs> <my>. <laughs> He's also just got that hyperactivity blood that he can do shit like this. So talking about the production of this song, 
he was in the studio with um, the guy who produced it said that he, like he had some records and he played him a record and he was like, do you like this song? And he's like, yeah, go back and create a beat like that for me. So the guy did it the same day and brought it back that night. He listened to it and it says in 15 minutes, he was already done with the lyrics. He went in the booth and without anyone telling him what the track was about, he just laid it out in one take, one fucking take. Then he told Val Young, the woman who sings vocals, what the concept was. And she went in and laid out her vocals in one take. After the vocals were done, they mixed it all up and the whole song was done in less than two hours. Whoa. Yeah. You, some of that stuff you never know whether it's like a, just apocryphal because it's good for the legend but he, fam he was fairly famous for like i think they recorded all eyes on me which is a double album like within a week or two of him getting out of prison That's awesome. yeah. just that so. that flow of thought like that like i get so tongue-tied you've seen me just on this podcast i can't talk i have mush mouth i cannot fathom being talented on this level and be able to just like flow like this and speak like this and just have something a song like this in one take blows my mm. mind and making it look easy and it's, and it's the it's the work that makes it look easy you know it's like it's the it's the all-nighters in the studio for three straight weeks that make that magical hour possible mm -hmm. it's insane that's crazy to me yeah he, okay so look it up he got out of prison in october of 95 <clears throat> and um, the, the, the All Eyes on Me was pushed back by a little bit, but it was slated for release in Christmas in 95. So he got out of prison in October and his album was supposed to come out at Christmas. <laughs> wow. Um, they were trying to capitalize on that prison heat, baby. Just yeah. bring, keep that energy going. It makes me think like he was doing a little more than smoking weed. I was like, this feels like meth energy. I'm not going to say he was smoking or doing meth, but I mean, mm -hmm. Adderall maybe? I don't know. Yeah. I also think that when Suge Knight spends $2 million getting you out of prison, you want to get him paid back as quick as you possibly can. Yeah. Like that's seriously creativity under heavy motivation. <laughs> yeah. The, the guy who may or may not have dangled vanilla ice over the side of a hotel balcony to get and give him a sound over the rights to uh, Ice Ice Baby. My favorite yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> How fucking scary is Suge? I remember seeing a tweet back in 2015 where someone's like, gas is under $2 and Suge is killing people. We're, the 90s is back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say who did the tweet. I'll have to, God, because it's, it's really good. I forgot who did it. That was really funny. One of the uh, one of the stops on uh, uh, on uh, uh, Hodari's Hood Life tour is the parking lot where Sugar Knight ran over those two guys, which is like literally a block and a half from uh, 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 Kendrick Lamar's old house. Oh, really? Oh, wow. yeah. That's a great tour. That yeah. would be a really great tour. I should. Uh, I'm going to look into that. <laughs> one more fun fact before we get into other stuff. Tupac's favorite song was Don McLean's Vincent. Do you even know? the song so i went and listened to it and it's catchy i was like okay i or like it's familiar i was like this was a hit it's a song don mclean wrote about vincent van gogh the painter uh when he was fatally wounded in 1996 um like when he was shot in vegas his girlfriend put this song on it near his hospital bed to be to ensure that it was the last song he would ever hear, which blew my mind. I would not have pictured this. But when you listen to the song, it's Don singing about Van Gogh painting Starry Night, reflecting on what it's like to be misunderstood and suffering for his insanity because he was schizophrenic. And I think Tupac related to that, like suffering for being misunderstood and, you know, possibly a mental illness. I mean, I just think the guy may have been a little bipolar. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we medicalize everything now, but everyone just used to be weird and either fun to be around or not fun to be around back in the day. <laughs> yeah, like, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like uh, how like autism is much more highly diagnosed in certain zip codes. It's like yeah. uh, just how much attention your kids gets from therapists. It's like if you're in Beverly Hills, autism rates are very, very high. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, all right, is that is that to live and die in LA? Mm -hmm. I think that is to live and die in LA. All right, right here. Oh, go ahead, Mark. I was gonna say, like, I'm glad we picked this because it's like his songs come in very different, various different genres. You got like like gangstery stuff, like hit him up or can't see me, and then well, actually can't see me is mostly just boasting about being a really good rapper and being rich, which is the core of a lot of rap music. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, uh, and then you got like some of the more political stuff, like changes or whatever. But living down in LA is kind of like it's just a little bit soulful and about like liking your life and sort of having some regrets. Some things are good, some things are bad, but things are mostly good. The sun's out, let's smoke weed and ride around. It's like, he doesn't have a lot of this. <laughs> yeah, I see it as a joyful tune. And when you watch the video, you very much get that vibe. But I feel like a lot of people on the underbelly side feel like it was very much, um, cause the whole East Coast, West Coast thing was going on, him showing where his loyalty was as well. Yeah. And getting a good dig in at Dre at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I imagine Dre caring about that for a second and then being like, go fuck yourself. I don't care. Yep. <laughs> he already had public feuds with Easy E and, you know, um, everybody in the NWA. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, Ice Cube called him. Uh, I mean, that's this is fairly, very, very mild for a diss track for like, uh, go listen to uh, um, uh, No Vaseline by Ice Cube and he gets it way worse from uh, in that song. Oh, wow. <laughs> To that i love disc disc tracks mm -hmm. um it's such a young man's game too as you can tell once all these guys hit like 30 they're like oh this is dumb <laughs> like i'm over this yeah yeah i mean if you survived if you survive and wrap to 30 i mean they're both literally in the business like you're like i'm super rich and i'm all i'm just gonna i'm fine i'm gonna have some <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna have some kids now <laughs> yeah um that's amazing too is that he died without any children am i right he didn't have any babies out there not that the world knows about. No. Yeah. yeah. All right. This might be a fun place to insert Six Degrees of Tommy Stinson with Jeremy Essig. Let's see how he connected uh, Tupac to the basis of the replacements. This is ought to be good. Hey, friends. You like the 90s? Well, then you're going to love this week's edition of Six Degrees, where we connect to hip-hop legend Tupac Shakur. Before he became the first solo rap artist inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Tupac began his career as a roadie for Oakland hip-hop collective Digital Underground, known best for their biscuit-grabbing hit, The Humpty Dance. And while Pac would record his first verse on the Underground's same song and eventually repay the favor on his first single, I Get Around, he would initially join the group as a dancer-slash-roadie right as Humpty Hump was leading the world to the right as if their leg was broken. Hump is one of the many alter egos of underground leader Gregory Jacobs, who used the name Shock G when performing with his real voice. Jacobs would also have a small acting career, appearing in the Dan Aykroyd movie Nothing But Trouble, along with Tupac and the rest of the underground, as well as a small role as a furnace repairman in the 1991 sitcom Drexel's Class. Okay, full disclosure, I have never heard of Drexel's Class until I was researching this. My initial plan was to go through Dan Aykroyd and his background cameo in the song We Are the World until I discovered Drexel's class. We need to take a small detour and discuss this show. It's crazy. Drexel's class starred Jason Biggs, who would go on to be Jim in American Pie, Matthew Lawrence, whoa, Joey's brother, AJ Langer, who would go on to be Ray Ann on My So Called Life, Brittany Murphy of Clueless fame, and just for good measure, Edie McClurg, best known as Grace from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh, and Drexel's class also had Phil Buckman on there, who would go on to play bass for Filter, who we talked about last week. But anyway, if that wasn't enough 90s for you, the episode with Shock G slash Humpty Hump also featured Jason Priestley, best known, of course, as Brandon Walsh from the decade-defining 90210, a show that would showcase the Goo Goo Dolls who, before appearing on the show's Peach Pit After Dark, were the opening act for The Replacements, and replacement singer Paul Westerberg would give the dolls the lyrics to their song We Are The Normal, as well as writing a number of songs for his own band, The Replacements, about the band's bassist, Tommy Stinson. So, as we back out of the 90s, we went Tupac, to Humpty Hump, to Brandon Walsh, to the Goo Goo Dolls, to Paul Westerberg, to Tommy Stinson. That's this week's Six Degrees. Back to Diane and Ben. And we're back. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. <laughs> <laughs> I literally don't. I haven't listened to it yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, our Dressed Up Like a Douche this week comes from Sarah Lynn. Uh, it's Weezer's song, Hash Pipe. Sarah thought he was saying, I got my ass wiped. Um, she said I was 14. Ah. I was 14 when that song came out. I didn't know what a hash pipe was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I just like yeah. the idea of just a guy singing over and over about having his ass wiped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think maybe I figured it out pretty quickly, but I think I maybe thought it was ass wiped for a little bit too. <laughs> it seems like one part where it does sound like he says that, like I knew he was saying hash pipe for one of it. And at one part, one part, it does sound like he says, I got my ass wiped. So <laughs> we could be wrong. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark, do you have a guilty pleasure song? I do. Um, are you familiar with the uh, the cameo song Word Up? Um, yes. Yes. I love a cover of that song by the band Korn. <laughs> <laughs> cameo would have been good enough. You took it to another level. <laughs> Dude, Korn. Oh my God. Cameo created that song, Korn perfected it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of this. Did they do it as like a joke? Well, there was that um, phenomenon in the 90s. It happened a few times, like Alien Ant Farm covered Smooth Criminal. Yes. You yeah. know, that's a good, I, I could have said that song too, except that song, honestly, I like it better than the Michael Jackson version. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and like like Limp Biscuit covered Faith. There was like, there, yes. there, there were a bunch of bands who were doing covers that I think were intended to be ironic when they when they had the idea but then they made it I'm like you know this is fucking cool so yeah. yeah all right that's oh my god i've never heard that i'm gonna listen to that immediately when we're done with it it's great it's great <laughs> i'm so excited all right mark promote yourself where can our listeners see and hear more of you um, the last show I was working on, uh, I think just finished airing, so there's no point in plugging that. Um, uh, but you can just follow me on Twitter at Mark Agee. Um, and when I have something to promote, you can read about it there. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good enough. Yeah, what shows have you written for? I know you worked for Jesselmeck, right? Yeah, I wrote on uh, Jesselmeck Offensive. Um, I worked for a few years on a show called Comedy Knockout that was on True TV, and uh, it was like a comedy panel game show. And then Recently, I wrote for a show on Netflix called Patriot Act. And after that, uh, late last year, I worked on a show for uh, True called Top Secret Videos, which is kind of a clip show and kind of, it's, it's the thing where you, it, you, you, you want to take an edible before you watch it and see people fall down and see comedians make fun of it. <laughs> well, that just sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right, Mark. Well, thank you so much for doing this. This is a great episode. You were a great guest for us to uh, make Ben feel squirrely doing hip hop. It really helped him I out. Really <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you for making this so easy for me. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye, Mark. We'll see you soon. Bye, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Remove. Um, <laughs> I hate when it says re don't report. All right. That was good, Ben. Uh, before we talk about next week, do you feel like you... Uh, Less nervous about that? How do you feel about that? I did it. I know everything about hip hop now. My street <laughs> credibility is through the roof. I'm, I'm gonna go start. You. I'm gonna go start throwing these things. Have you met my? <laughs> Your potatoes. Have you met my friends? My potatoes. <laughs> have you met my friends? Hard luck and trouble. They're my only friends. <laughs> All right, well, you're going to feel better because next week we're going back to just you and I, and we're going back to our love of electronic music, New Wave from the 80s, uh, with, to me, it's one of the most iconic dance club song from the 80s and 90s. You could go to a club in all of the 80s and most of the 90s, and if it was a legit dance club, you're going to hear this song. We're going to cover Blue Monday by New Order. Woohoo! How does it zone. feel to, to treat, treat me, me like you do? It's going to be good stuff. <laughs> All right, Ben. You ready to close it down? I am Vogue. <laughs>